Yeah. A uh, very good afternoon to all of you. I thank Dr. Balavenkat for calling me here, and I'm so excited that uh, I might uh, really be cutting my talk short so I can listen to the ones that follow. <laughs> yes. So, how to interpret a CT scan? Uh, I had three questions which didn't come up. So, uh, is this on the buzzer? Okay, so these are questions on the buzzer. It'll just take my time, I suppose. So, yeah. So, yes. What I wanted to know, that how many of us can elegantly pull out a CT scan from the cover, hold it up straight in a second, and not for a second feel a little embarrassed about whether they are holding it up straight or not, upside down or not, left to right or not? Wonderful, 39% can, and I am in the group three. Many times, I'm pretty embarrassed whether the name is on correct or not. So I'm there with 39% of us. The next one is this CT scan. Can, I would like you to say this CT scan may indicate which one of the following. Is this an intracranial hemorrhage? Is it representative of an acute ischemic stroke? a hydrocephalus following subarachnoid hemorrhage, or an edema surrounding a space occupying lesion. We will come to this as I talk, but as we can see, it's divided. The third question, another CT scan brain. It is a uh, uh, space-occupying lesion. Uh, how many of us feel this is a high-grade glioma, a meningioma, a tumor metastasis, or an astrocytoma? Good. We have a greater number saying meningioma, which is right, and I'll cover this in less detail. Don't worry, I'm not trying to make us into radiologists, neither into neurosurgeons. What we will discuss in the next less than 10 minutes now are the common techniques used to perform a head CT, the basics, how, what is a normal brain CT scan, and we will run through a mnemonic so that we can do a thorough and quick review of a CT scan to rule out any pathology that may kill. That is all we're going to try to do. Just like we have a structured approach to an ECG reading, we should have a structured approach to CT scan. Before I knew this, even having trained in neurocritical care and neuroanesthesia, sometimes I would peer at a CT scan and hope that the pathology jumped out at me, or if it didn't, still wonder, am I leaving something out? That's the aim of this lecture. I will have to start with this gentleman since today this meet is all about leadership. A genius electrical engineer from rural UK who developed the CT scan machine. And in his Nobel lecture, he says that he was successful because of two reasons. One was maybe because he came from rural UK and he got a lot of time to think. And the second one he mentioned was probably because he was never married. He probably hadn't heard the lecture in the morning about the leadership. So the basics. CT scan is simple. You have a console which moves around the patient 360 degrees. X-rays come from one side, they're detected on the other side. As they pass through the patient's body, they're absorbed differently by different structures, so they're attenuated. And this is read by the computers in a scale of gray. So starting from white, which is bone, which is very dense, and it's read as Hounsfield units plus 1,000, to air, which is black, read as Hounsfield minus 1,000, with water in between, which is zero. We also have some windows. 
So if, you, if your radiologist wants to look at the brain properly, he'll call for the brain window or the bone window or the subdural window. We need to know what the normal brain is, certain basics. In a CT scan, we go from down upwards. So left is right and right is left. If we know what are the normal structures on our path, reading becomes so much easier. So there are eight levels which we should be able to recognize in a normal brain scan. I'll run through them quickly. It always starts from below, like in this picture, to save the lens, the CT scan cuts always go from the base of the brain upwards. So that's how the normal brain scans run. The first one is the base of the skull, and you can start seeing the medulla and the cerebellar tonsils there. As we go up, that's the cerebellar level. You can still see the cerebellum, but the temporal lobes start to appear. You have the ethmoid and the sphenoid sinuses. You have the mastoid air cells and the external auditory meters. Fracture of the base of the skull, you'll see blood here. The third level is the higher pons level. The pons has appeared, the frontal lobes, the temporal, the cerebellum continues. You've also started to see the fourth ventricle over here and the supracellar cistern just behind the dorsum celli where you would expect the pituitary to be along with the circle of villus. Higher up you go and you start seeing the, the supracellar cistern, the sylvian cistern, and the fourth ventricle are all visible um, along with the circummesencephalic cistern. These are important because these get compressed as the brain pressure rises. These are the sensitive areas to get compressed first. We will talk about that later. Higher up, this is the midbrain level. Again, you start seeing the frontal horn of the lateral ventricles. The third ventricle has appeared and the rest of the brain is there along with the cerebellum. Coming to the basal ganglia level, the, the nuclei, the caudate, the lentiform over here, and you see the internal capsule as well. The last two, you've moved further up, you're able to see the lateral ventricles much better, and at the vertex, this is the place where you look at the sulci and gyri, especially in elderly patients, to find out if the loss of volume is physiological or it's pathological. So in an elderly patient, the sulci and gyri here will be much bigger, the sulci. That was the normal CT scan. So when you are faced with an acute CT scan, you have to have a systematic approach to reading it. Start with confirmation. Identify the patient. The date is right. The time is right. Correlate the clinical features and compare with any previous scans that he may be able to give you. Once you've done that, you need to check for the common artifacts. CT scans have evolved over generations. In the present, we have third or fourth generation CT scans, and yet there are certain common artifacts that we see. The best way to avoid being confused by artifacts is to see all films and not just look at one film in isolation. So something that would look like this in a single uh, cut may very well just be a normal petrous temporal bone. The artifacts, I will not go into detail, but usually appear due to the nature of the scan itself, when there is the tissue be between two thick bones due to movement or foreign bodies. The mnemonic that we will be talking about is more discussed and taught in emergency medicine circles, but it's very simple and it can help all of us. It's simple. Blood can be very bad, popularized by this group here, evidence-based to be, have a very sharp learning curve. And if you want practice, these are the websites that give you a lot of free practice. So blood can be very bad. That's how you go through the CT scan when it comes to you. B for blood. Look for blood. Where is it? Is it there at all? If it is, where is it? And what is it doing? Is it causing a mass effect? So we know all this. I'm not going to tell you what an EDH looks like. Biconcave, look, uh, biconvex looks like an igli. That's blood. It's extradural. Looks crescentic. That's subdural hemorrhage. That's blood and internal intraventricular blood. Wherever there is acute bleeding in the brain, it will be very bright because of the globin. And as time passes, there is metabolism. It does not absorb the CT scans anymore. By about two weeks, it becomes isodense. And after that, it will become hypodense as related to the brain. So that's blood. Can be very bad. Can is for cisterns. 
Inside the cisterns, which we just spoke about, there is the circummesencephalic, the supracellar, the quadrigeminal, and the sylvian. Say if there is any blood, again, blood will look white. Are the cisterns open? Are they symmetrical on both sides? Or is one of them compressed because of unilateral pressure? The supracellar cistern will have blood very often due to subarachnoid hemorrhage. The sylvian cistern will be affected in trauma. But if there is blood, if it is compressed, something is abnormal. B, B for brain. Examine the brain parenchyma for symmetry. Is there bilateral symmetry? Look for the line shift and look for sulcal effacement. So yes, this is the first degree of increased intracranial pressure because of something white here. White means blood. It's acute, non-contrast CT. So it's an intracranial, intracerebral hemorrhage, an ICH. Hypodense area here is the edema, and it has started causing pressure, which has caused effacement of the sulci over here. That's first degree. Another pathology which has caused increased pressure to a higher degree, effaced sulci, midline shift, loss of symmetry, compression of the ventricles. But the sulci on the other side are still normal. And then the third degree, where all the sulci are gone. Look for hyper or hypodensity uh, and gray-white differentiation. Hypodensity is uh, lacunar infarcts, or you can see metastasis, ring enhancement in contrast CTs, or a big area of hypodensity in infarctions. The loss of gray-white differentiation is an early sign for infarct. If you compare from this, the insular ribbon sign is lost. So it's an infarct in the early stages. That's how it looks like. The size of the ventricles can become very large when there is a hydrocephalus. It can be kinked, like I showed before, or in old age, all the sulci will be increased along with the ventricles. Blood can be very bad. Bones, you're looking at the fractures. How do you differentiate a fracture in the bone brain as against a suture? It's very simple. The suture, the, uh, the cortex stays continuous, whereas it is discontinuous in a fracture. A bony window will help you see this. I'll just take 15 seconds more. Will help you see this. And if there is blood, this is because of fracture of the base of the skull. The aim of this talk was to not miss what you cannot afford to. And some typical CT scans have not shown, but because of time interest, this is a patient we had who had uh, a delta sign positive because of blockage of the cerebral venous system. This is an acute on chronic STH. This is pneumocephalus, the Mount Fuji sign, post-operative. And finally, the question that we gave you, this is a meningioma, because you see the dural tail sign, and it's brightly enhancing on the CT scan. Again, a question. This was the artery hardening sign in infarction. And that's the last. So greetings from Orissa and Ames from the eastern part of the country. And that's where I work. Thank you.